I will talk to you of art, for there is nothing else to talk about. For there is nothing else. The artist is. All others are not. Where are Leonardo, Rembrandt, Ludwig? Alive. 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 They were born. Bring on the multitude with a multitude of fishes. Feed them to the fishes for liberal. Nourish the artist. Stretch their spirits upon an easel to give him canvas. Crush their bones into a paste that he might mold them. Let them die. By their miserable deaths become the clay within his hands. That he might form an ashtray. By trade, I'm a writer, photographer, and musician. All that is comes through the eye of the artist. I roll out of bed anywhere between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m., put my slippers on one foot at a time, and shuffle off to the bathroom to take a shower in preparation for a long day of sitting at my computer, editing photographs and video. If we weren't dependent upon my wife's income from her job in the corporate world, we'd be begging for change on the street corner if we tried to survive solely from the revenue I generate from the sale of my artwork. In the back of my mind, I've always wondered, am I the only one struggling to make a living from my art? Am I the only one who became an artist so late in life? I had to know because these questions have been gnawing at me for years. When I was a kid, I had this notion that by day, artists were secluded in large drafty warehouse studios, hidden deep in the bowels of some metropolitan area basking in the glow of natural light pouring in from a wall of floor-to-ceiling industrial factory windows they'd paint amazing portraits by night they'd attend wild parties filled with poets dreamers and sophists smoking brown cigarettes donning black berets and tight black turtleneck sweaters they'd dance sing and contemplate a world filled with peace and love until the wee wee hours of the morning but was that really how artists were living their lives artists. We all know one. We all have a friend or a relative who is a musician, a painter, or a photographer. On the outside, some artists appear to be conservative, straightforward, clean-cut individuals, while others dress in eccentric clothing with their hair dyed a vibrant blue or pink, and we think to ourselves, what freaks? Why don't they get a real job? But maybe, many of the people who are so judgmental, especially those who are sequestered to the 8-to-5 grind, are perhaps just a tad bit jealous and envious of the skill and the apparent freedoms of their creative counterparts. Filled with resentment, they sit stuck in rush hour traffic, wishing they didn't give up on the dream of being an artist when they were younger. Maybe some were convinced that they would never make a living at it and become the dreaded starving artist. Maybe it wasn't the right time or they chose to have a family instead. Maybe some of you watching this film are just like I was. Somewhere in your past you gave up on your dream of becoming an artist and it gnaws away at your conscience. Is it ever too late to become an artist? What is it really like to be an artist? Let's take a look and see. I think the whole point to the, to the documentary, The Artist, I wanted to give the average everyday person a viewpoint of what it's like to be an artist and how hard it is. Not necessarily to, to gain their empathy or their sympathy, but to, to get an inside perspective of the time invested in a work of art, money invested, the sweat, and the blood, blood, sweat, and tears that are put into any given product, whether it's a video or a photograph or a painting or a sculpture or a play or a movie. I mean, everything in our life is touched by the hands of an artist. Those who dream and design are always contributing to our ways of work. Working situations benefit from a new kind of layout, bright, open, and inviting. The modern designer creates beauty through simplicity, bringing to active business a look of casualness, a look of luxury, combining to create a new look to American efficiency. There's a fresh look to fun in America today. 
stylists have added new zest to recreation by bringing an exciting look to the large variety of things which make leisure hours more pleasurable. Designers design cars. They have a, an artistic flair for uh, composition, architecture, um, arts put into food. Um, the cover our, uh, our cereal boxes are designed by artists and graphic designers. Every single thing we see, hear, feel, and touch is graced by the hands of an artist. And our society seems to want to undermine that for some reason, make it seem as if it's not that important, that it's some type of flimsy type of career, that it's people should go out and get a real job. To get the ball rolling, I contacted illustrator and fine artist Logan Rogers of Tip City, Ohio, a small town near Dayton, to see if he'd be interested in appearing in my film. Logan and I have been friends since the mid-1980s when we studied graphic design together at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. He has been an illustrator and fine artist for over 30 years. Logan thought my idea to make a documentary about artists was a great idea and he jumped at the chance to participate. So during the summer of 2020, I jumped into my car and headed to Dayton. Logan introduced me to a variety of very talented artists in Tip City and within the Dayton arts community. When I started this documentary, I was on a quest to see if other artists were struggling to make ends meet like I was. People were buying my photography, books, and music, but I wasn't generating the kind of income that would allow my wife and I to survive if she were to lose her full-time job in the corporate world. But what I found to be really confusing was many of the artists I had met over the previous years claimed to be selling enough work to pay the rent and put food on the table. But were they just putting on a brave face? Rodney Veal was the first person on my list of artists to meet with. Rodney is the two-time Emmy Award-winning host of Think TV's The Art Show. I, I was, my, my, my life trajectory, everything that I do, I am, first and foremost, I started off as a dancer, choreographer, but I was always a visual artist. Mm -hmm. um, and even as a little child um, and so I like most people I, you know I might, uh, when you go to college uh, not that most people some people go to college um, uh, I have a, a bachelor's degree in visual arts and political science which is a whole crazy uh, backstory on that and then a master's degree in choreography my kind of gig thing was that I thought I was just going to be a dancer because it was just that that took my over my life at a certain point at the age of 25 I was in a ballet company in the second company and then just from 25 until 40 that's all I did was I danced I was learning training choreographing trying to figure out this thing to be an artist and so that's that's kind of the kind of in a nutshell like like my arts background is like you know it's just all these different genres these different worlds performance world the visual arts world and and it all came through with education and so that's me so i was taking a look at your bio and it said that for a short time after college you worked at the ohio department of transportation was this your plan b because you felt like you couldn't make it as an artist <laughs> yeah. and you're just kind of Worried about that? I think, and I, I'm, I'm reading this really great book. I finished it. It's a very thin book. Jerry Saltz, S A T uh, S A L T Z. He um, he's the art critic for the New York Magazine. He wrote a book on how to be an artist, and he basically said there is no Plan B. Either you are or you aren't. The plan. What what that means is, he says, that doesn't mean that you make a, you an artist and then you get evicted from your home, you lose your car, <laughs> you have no food in your stomach, and you're starving. He says that is the. He says that is the stupidest idea ever. Is <laughs> an artist. It's not a plan B. So quit calling it a plan B. Just saying it's you. You know that a you like you like if you like eating burgers, you better have some burger money. That being said, that doesn't mean that stops you from being an artist. So, like, if you work as a nurse and you work at, oh, you know, most nurses, it's not a full six to five day a week shift. It's like three days on, two days off. On your two days off, out comes the camera, out comes the paint, out comes the dance movement and videotape and a creaking movement. Because the nursing paid for you to have the ability to make the art. 
Does that make the art less because you didn't do it 24 seven? No, that means that you didn't buy into the myth of the fake myth, which is just so ridiculous, of the fucking starving artist. That's some bullshit. That was artificial manipulation so that you could use it as like, you don't want to be like that. They starve. That was that was a parallel. That, that, that is like something from like the late ninth, like late 19th century. That was to stop people from exploring and creating was to create the myth of the starving artist. After meeting with Rodney, I headed up to Tip City to meet with Logan. It had been a few years since we had gotten together. So we took the afternoon to get reacquainted. Once I got to Logan's house, he suggested we go for a ride so he could give me a tour of town. So we jumped into his car and he gave us the nickel tour and he told us of the rich history of his hometown. The town has grown a lot in the last 30 years or so. And I grew up here, we moved here when I was three. And, and this is home. I've really only lived, the only other place I've lived was Athens for four years. Came back here after graduation and got married and stayed. Athens, Ohio, right? Yes, Athens, Ohio. Home of uh, Ohio University. <laughs> you can say their name. I can say Ohio University. Yeah, just can't I just I can't do this. I can't wear this. I can't wear this. Or OU's legal department is gonna get all over me. Never know. Never know. God. Lived here for off and on for 50 years now. The last couple of years I've been on city council. I love the town. I've got deep roots. I wanted to get shots of this barn because I've done three paintings of it so far. Okay. It's, uh, there's another little town about eight miles away called West Milton, Ohio. It has a kind of a charming little downtown like Tip Cities. And I was, I was painting their downtown. I did a Christmas card that, that, and a postcard that kind of sold okay down there. Oh. Yeah, so that, that's quite a bit of what I do. I, I paint a lot of local buildings and landscapes. And the water tower's right over here. Yeah, it's, but, um, but halfway between the two towns is that old barn that's about half fallen can, down. And just, okay, yeah, just right screams there. to be painted. How many years have you been employed? Well, I, 89 or 91. I graduated from OU in 1990, and I went to work I, I came back to, to this area. I've often thought that if I, I family in Atlanta, if I'd gone to Atlanta or even, even as close as Columbus or Cincinnati, I could have found work a little more lucrative in my, in my field, if you like. But I didn't know that then. See, you know, this is the Dayton, Ohio area. Dayton's the big city everyone commutes to. And there was work for somebody like me, but you didn't really need a college degree to, to do it. And over the years, I've had a number of people to say, you went to college and you're doing this? Because a lot of people right out of high school or right out of a year or two of community college have gone into production art for various types of businesses. And so far I've done three paintings of it, two in the fall and one in the winter. I want to get one in the summer, but it's going to have to be a year when the corn's up because soybeans just aren't very picturesque. Sorry, soybeans. When I got back to Logan's house, I got a chance to sit down with both Logan and his mom and discuss Logan and his artwork throughout the years, what he was like as a kid, when he started drawing, and the kind of things he drew. What a fascinating conversation with a warm, wonderful lady. I've lived with mom the last few years since I've been divorced, and she's 92 now, and yeah. needs some help around the house, and needs, uh, needs to be driven to some doctor's appointments sometimes to keep her, keep her safe and healthy. And this is the house I grew up in. I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy to be here. I'm here. glad to have him. It's, it's not fun living all by yourself. Yeah. Well, he just always drew, even when he was little. Oh wow! What's yeah. your earliest memory of him drawing? We had a little 
table and chairs by the window in the dining room. And there was notebooks there, and he was always drawing in those. He drew even when he was little. What kind of pictures did he draw? Oh, gosh, horses. <laughs> and his dad showed him how to make it look like a horse was running because you couldn't get the legs right. <laughs> Cowboys and Indians. Oh, yeah, wow. stuff like that. What uh, Do you have any other, uh, or, or uh, uh, Mike or Terry, are they artists? I think Mike could have. If he, he, he painted. He used yeah, to paint. Yeah, he, he painted and he drew. Awesome. Um, what was your reaction when Logan announced he was going to go to college to study art? Well, it was okay, except his dad sort of thought he ought to do journalism because we owned a bunch of newspapers. Okay. And he, we wanted him to do what he wanted to do, but his dad kind of looked in that direction, didn't he, for a little bit. But Nobody in the family did that kind of work. He was probably thinking... Yeah, but yeah. that's what he wanted to do. We, we said, okay, do what you want to do. Did you ever secretly say, oh, I wish he'd get a real job? Or no, did you ever look at no, it like that? that. No. Oh, not like that. that. No. Um, no, we always supported him. All our kids, right. whatever they wanted to do. We had three boys. What What would you say is one of your most favorite pieces of artwork that he's done? And what about the no, pictures the, of Dad's ship I did at the Navy reunion? Oh, well, yeah, that's mm -hmm. the one that's in the... That, mm -hmm. Yeah, we took that with us. And I have a huge one in my bedroom. And that was all rolled up and we took it with us and uh, had it in the, in the recreation room and all the guys that was on his ship said, that's how it was. We kept looking at it and pointing out all the things and said, that's how it was. So his, his painting was that accurate? Yes. Oh, yes. wow. wow. And, and a lot of them wanted copies, didn't they? Yeah. yeah wanted copies. That was a, a digital painting. It was like building a model. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. What, what impresses you most about Logan's work? Well, we always thought he could... I mean, what he does now, even. It's always been part of his life. I mean, he's always painted and drawn, and and I, I think Mike could have done some if he would have, but, but you did more than he did. And he's a big help around here for you? Oh, yeah. Oh, good. I don't know what to do without him. <laughs> you don't wish he'd just get out of the oh, house? No. And, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> no. Well, that's nice. No, no, no. I'm glad he's here. What, what do you think the world will be like with no art? I think it'll be a sadder place. Wow, that's a good question. Pretty boring. Nothing would be like it is because art touches everything. That's a great question. We headed into the basement where Logan keeps his studio to ask him a few questions about what it's like to be an artist. The artist, Logan Rogers interview, row one, one alpha, take one. Hi. Hi, I'm Logan Rogers. Hi. Would you like to buy a car? <laughs> there are no mistakes, just happy accidents. Happy little trees, little oh, clouds. That's right. that's you that's right. Right. What's his name? Bob Ross uh -huh. is that guy's Logan name. Ross. And he's kind of kind of famous. This is my studio. This is where I try to spend several hours a day painting. Luckily, I have enough work right now to keep me busy. I've discovered that it's a good problem to have, but it's also a problem. And if I don't, if I don't keep after it, I fall behind. And the studio is kind of a work in progress. I uh, I did have a studio space somewhere else, and but but like everything else, change change keeps you on your toes, I guess. So I'm uh, I like the fact that I'm I'm here in the house with mom. It's she needs she kind of needs me around. It's. It's a good space. You know, my father and I built this basement back in the 80s and my kids like to come down here and do their their crafting. My daughter, of course, is an art student at Miami Valley Career Tech Center and she's she's down here painting a lot. It's nice that she has a space to work to. So it kind of brings us close and we have fun together. But you want to show us your painting? Oh, yeah. Um... Is there a title to it or anything like that? No, 
not really. I, uh, just a painting I did, uh, last night, actually, by the time that this was filmed. Mm -hmm. Um, it's Medusa with acrylics. It's very stylized. That's kind of how my work differs from my father's because he's more of a realist. Like he yeah, more yeah. realistic and I usually paint or draw what comes out of my head. Um, so but, you can make that from your, from your imagination? Yeah. Does it symbolize anything? No, I just think Medusa's pretty badass. <laughs> I wanted to paint her. I've, um, I really liked Greek and Norse mythology as a kid. Like I, I liked the Percy Jackson series and I liked like Avengers, like the Thor and Loki and everything like that. I just thought it was the stories and mythology was really, really cool. So Medusa has always been kind of like a interesting character to me. She was the one that she looked at you, you were turned to stone, right? Yeah. That's excellent. I like the colors, the colors in there. Thank you. Wait till you get in college. You'll you'll be asked to explain the symbolism behind the colors. And yeah, you need to yeah. get you need to get good at making stuff up off the cuff. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, I just think snakes oh, are cool. Yeah, snakes symbolize negative turmoil. Right. right. <laughs> you'll wait if you ever go to OU or something like that. You'll hear all these crazy people talking about the the darkness of their soul. <laughs> oh, my soul is so dark. <laughs> I'm in Athens, Ohio, and I'm under 25. I have so much to be miserable about right now. <laughs> How long have you been trying? Oh, since about I could hold a crayon. So from a pretty young age. I kind of started getting more serious about it, though, when I was like seven or eight. When my mom and dad divorced and I came over here a lot and there wasn't a lot to do. So I just started drawing. And so much of an influence was Logan on you? Uh, a fair amount. He wasn't like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I remember being a kid and pestering him to draw me stuff, like, draw me, draw a dragon, draw like a horse. And he'd sit there and bust out like badass dragon and like in a cave with the smoke coming out of its nose. And I remember being like, damn, <laughs> I want to do that. She and I have had this conversation a lot. She knows it's a difficult line of work, and I, I sure hope she gets more guidance than I got in her age. Because when uh, at her age, when I was growing up, nobody else in the family had ever done this kind of work, or really knew anyone who did. I just figured if you, if you're talented, it'll work out. But you got to work really hard. <laughs> Sometimes when you get out of high school, and you know, art is not your only outlet anymore. It becomes it becomes a little more like work. You're like, oh, yes. back when there was nothing else that I could do or enjoyed doing, I would. Mm -hmm. I just love to do my art. Now it's like, wow, there's other stuff I can do. What do you hope to do? Or do you hope to be a graphic designer one day? Or I. That's that's a question. Um, being a senior in high school, the win I feel like the window to decide what kind of person I'm going to be is slowly getting smaller and smaller. So that it does a little that bit. question has been kind of weighing on me a lot. And I I've been thinking I want to do something art related. Like I've had a period of time where I want to do animation. I also have been really into like designing tattoo and doing tattoo. Um, then I was thinking maybe advertising, even though of course no artist really like loves the commercial aspect of graphic art, but I figured it'd be something, but like I now I'm thinking it maybe would just be happy enough having it as a hobby and trying to figure out something else. What would be your ideal situation as an artist? Like, would you rather have your uh, separate studio or are you happy where you're at now? It's probably important to be able to paint anywhere. It would be fun to have a, uh, have a real bright airy studio with windows and maybe floor to ceiling glass and 
and uh, really, really slick lighting and a tab array that slides around. It would be kind of fun, but you, you ought to be able to paint anywhere. You ought to be able to paint like plain air in a park with a, with a board across your knees. It was a beautiful Saturday morning in October when I attended the Indian Creek Distillery Plain Air Art Event in New Carlisle, Ohio with Logan. On Plain Air is a French expression which means in the open air or outdoors. At Plain Air Art Events, artists set up their easels in an outdoor setting and paint landscapes. He was one of more than 30 artists participating that day. During the morning and early afternoon, he painted a landscape of the Staley Farm Sawmill located on the grounds of the Indian Creek Distillery. It was amazing to watch Logan paint this landscape. He made it seem effortless. After several hours, his painting was complete. An onlooker, who offered him a sizable sum for his creation, made an already perfect autumn day even better. How do you feel about your situation where you are right now as an artist, your stage and, and this stage in your life? Uh, I need to get moving. I'm not, uh, I'm not getting any younger. I've learned a lot. I've, there's a lot of things that I wish I had learned sooner. Um, the people that I have met along the way who do this kind of work have been just tremendously helpful and encouraging. I can't, I can't stress enough how encouraging everyone has been once they realize that this is what you really want to do. If you're serious about, about doing this kind of thing, then it's, you'll find a, a whole community of people who are willing to be helpful. We headed across town to meet with Rusty Harden, a member of the Tip City Area Arts Council and a friend of Logan Rogers. Rusty is an artist, author, mentor, and community advocate who has devoted her life to the unpredictable beauty of creativity. Rusty owns and operates Rusty Harden Studio, located in downtown Tip City. My work is primarily water media. And I have to say like water media because I work in um, acrylic, I work in watercolor, I work in um, water soluble graphite, and I also work in water solu soluble oils. I'd say the best part about my work is there's a story in them. I decided to be a, an artist, you know, probably what, 17 years ago. And um, I learned a lot of lessons and I learned them quickly. And one of the things I learned is that um, 
as an art, and this is this is probably for me, you know, I just really don't know everybody, but for me, I learned early on that the strength of, of being an artist is really in the art community. And um, that really required bringing along other artists with us. And that's, um, yeah, I don't know that I met you that early. No, it was probably... 2012 or 2013. Mm -hmm. So I'd already been working as an artist in Tip City for about for about 10 years by then. But, um, you know, I, I just learned what well, I felt. It's not that I learned anything, I guess. But I really felt that if we could create the art community, then, then together we could be a stronger visual voice in in the community and something for the the. Um, for the people of the community to be attached to. And it was important to grow their experience with art in order for them to have an interest to be a part of the art. So we both have been involved in the Arts arts Council. I, I um, You way more than me. Okay, yeah. I just drag him along. Yeah. You know? So I think that as, as um, you know, establishing yourself as an artist, nobody's just gonna walk in and like, oh my God, you're the best artist I've ever seen. Now they may experience that when they see my work or your work or somebody's work, right? But it takes, it takes more than that for them to um, get connected enough maybe to want it, but um, you know, we're all in this boat trying yeah. to find a way to do what we do. Yeah, you've said you have to, you have to kind of sell your story. I believe that, in the story. That's a struggle for me sometimes is to, to get my, my story out into You don't have a story? I don't know. Or you just don't tell your story? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe, maybe my, my story is not for general audiences. I don't know. I, Could be I have a hard time, hard time. So con- there's more to you than what we've already got on camera. Conveying it in my work. Oh yeah, there's you know, oh, there hidden, the hidden depths. So you had mentioned how the general public views art, and that was awesome. You talked about that. Number one, we live in a world where people are trendy. They, whatever they have, they know they're probably going to change it, roll it over in a few years. So whatever painting that matched their couch is going to go out with the couch. But um, most people are not buying um, artwork with an emotional investment. They didn't feel a strong enough connection to spend those dollars on it. But a lot of them really are not in a position to invest in that kind of, that kind of um, sale, really. And then it goes back to probably didn't match the couch and it, you know it's not putting them down it's just it's just what our society is what are you done something to me something deep down inside of my prana oh water i want to be with you you're creative what is your impression of what you think an artist's life is like just the standard girl or gal that or guy or gal that is a painter or a musician do you have a stereotypical idea how you think their lives are versus the reality of it um, I guess depends upon the day and maybe what their um, medium is um, probably I think they're like everyone else on the street um, depends upon maybe what uh, state of mind they're in or what. I don't necessarily know that there's a there's a stereotypical thing that I view an artist being because I think artist is an expression of who the person is. Or what they're working on that can maybe adjust how they're thinking or how they are. It's probably pretty hard creating things and redoing things and then trying to have to convince people to purchase your stuff or you know explain why you've been doing things the way you've been doing them. Uh, a friend of mine, I've known her since she was 14, Adelie Gagné, like I was driving back from running errands in um, downtown Dayton and there she is sitting on the sidewalk right next to Brightside Music's festival, painting her mural, eating a sandwich, like that is an artist's life. Also to recognize that they have never really sat down with artists to understand how artists make art. The general public, they say it, but they, even if they're kids or their grandkids or someone they know in their family is an artist, they don't really have conversation with that person about art making to demystify it. We have to do that. That's what we demystify that. So if, if someone knew that, that, you know, you have to, 
in order to get that great photograph, that's a composition. What, what goes in the composition what the eye sees? And explaining it in layman terms. You just can't click a camera and then go, oh, let me go in that app. And then if I change the color and I do this, see, it's a massive. No, that's a manipulation. Now, did you create and compose something with the intentionality? It's the intention. And I think that that's what we have to kind of work with with the general public is demystification of what we do. Like that it is rigorous. It's just as rigorous as any other pursuit. After filming for several months, I had yet to find any wild parties within the Dayton art community. So I traveled to downtown Dayton to attend first Fridays at Front Street Art Galleries. There was bound to be a wild exotic scene filled with hedonistic play and debauchery. First Friday events are held at art galleries across the country. The general public is invited inside to meet the artists, see their studios, and view their artwork. Front Street is the largest group of artists, artisans, and small business owners in Dayton. I was shocked upon arrival. None of the artists were wearing black berets and turtleneck sweaters while smoking brown cigarettes. Where were the dancing girls, I asked myself. Where were all the eccentric creatives who talked about peace and love? Where were all the lazy, emaciated, starving artists that society speaks of? My shock subsided after meeting a variety of well-fed, skilled, and highly motivated men and women who had dedicated their lives to their craft. Uh, we uh, actually, we know the family uh, who, who started Front Street originally back in 65. I've uh, known them for about 35 years now, actually plus. And um, the uh, Zimmel was actually my mentor in the real estate business. So um, back in uh, 2015, when Morty, who was the property manager, retired, they asked me to come down there for a couple months and give them some ideas and kind of build a plan, a long-term plan of what, where it should go to and how they should be handling things. And you know, like I say, that was two. I was supposed to be here for two months, but five years later, you know, I'm still here wow. working on it. So Richard's too modest. I mean, he he's a financial analyst by trade, and they sent him down to look at some numbers. And he came down and um, fell in love with Front Street, the buildings, the people. And he called me in Chicago, where we're from, and he said, "Well, you know, Dayton is a fixer upper." And I said, no, absolutely not. No dating. Good fixer-uppers, I love. Yeah, he can't resist. And um, Richard was instrumental in turning around Front Street and creating the artist community that is today. He, he revitalized First Friday, which spread through downtown Dayton. And he, um, he understands business issues very well. And he was able to create community. He... Um, he brought people together. He introduced artists that were already here to each other and said, you know, you've got common areas of interest that overlap. But he created a, the spirit of community that is Front Street and brings people here and, and artists here and helps artists create. How, how many artists do you have here now? Uh, we have over 60 artists here. Oh, wow. Mm, we have 60 to 100 artists. If you look at like Dartery, where they have a, a group of artists in there showing their work, they have 18 artists just in that one space alone. If you look at it that way, we have over 100 artists that are involved and with Front Street some way or another. has over 20. Yeah, Dutoy has a number of artists in there as well. Okay, and that's sure. a group of actually um, professors like from UD, Sinclair, Central State, okay. uh, Wright State. That they all um, got together and started a gallery for themselves. And that's up on the third floor here. We also have uh, just started um, with, it's a, it's a conglomerate of, of university called Gallery EDU, and that is collaborative education. Um, it's, it's together, They're, once we're past COVID, the students will come and create and learn together from various professors, and the impetus is Linda Karen, who's Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Wright State. And we brought in, she brought in University of Dayton, um, Clark, um, I think Miami of Ohio, there are several universities that will be involved in, in a brand new collaborative effort to teach art across all disciplines. I met with Dana Wiley, owner of Wiley Gallery located inside of Front Street. We discussed the human element of being an artist and what it's like to own a gallery in the digital age. But I, I 
was in Plymouth with Hollywood, and I thought we all had to wear like French berets, wearing like, black turtlenecks, and wild parties, smoking around cigarettes. <laughs> we had lots of wild parties with, inside a secluded place in downtown Dayton, or, uh, you, or, or is that all hush hush? Don't talk about that. Stuff. You know, it's really that's pretty hilarious because I think that that's sort of always kind of in the back of my mind. I I think that that's. So for me, I, I mean, I, I don't necessarily define it by wild parties, but I do love the idea of artists getting together and sitting and having a glass of wine or whatever it is and, yeah. and, and talking about what art is and what art isn't and, and all of those questions and all of those things that, you know, as artists, we, we think about and we contemplate and, and, and just the philosophy of art. I think that that's, in my mind, that's, that's what I, you know, I, I wish we could do. We, we kind of started to do that before, you know, this whole COVID thing hit where we were kind of connecting with different artists and not just artists, but just different people in the community. You know, we, we kind of started this thing at Front Street where we would have people, we just kind of invited the whole building. Anybody could come in and we would have it like once a month or something like that. And, and people could come in and do just that. You know, you could have a glass of wine and you could sit and we, we started off trying to have topics, but really the conversation was just, you know, it just kind of went wherever it went. And that was good too. You know, there's, I really didn't want to have any sort of, um, uh, you, you know, there were no limitations. You could just say whatever and, and, and discuss whatever. Um, so, and I think that that's, that's, it's great to kind of get into those kinds of discussions with artists and you, you are really then forced to, um, either defend your opinions or, you know, you, you open yourself up to other ideas and, you know, um, so I think that those types of discussions are really important. How hard do you think it is to be an artist? Oh, I think it's extremely difficult. Um, in the sense that you if you if you want to have this be your full-time job i think it it takes a lot there's just so many different elements you have to wear so many different hats to be to get yourself out there um you not only i mean creating art creating art is hard enough that's extremely difficult task um and then you have to be your own you know, PR person and, you know, you have to do your own marketing and you have to be your, I mean, just, there's just a, you're, it's a business. It's all these different things that you, that you have to, to try to be for, to, to advocate, advocate your art. Uh, and get it out there. So I, I, you know, I hear from different people, you know, when I told my family that I wanted, you know, I wanted to go to school for art, I think, you know, they, they were supportive, but at the same time, I knew that that was, um, e e you know, why at my age, maybe that wasn't the smartest move. Um, but I, and I think that some people look at art and they think, oh, well, you know, anybody could be an artist. And um, it's just simply not true. And I, and I think that, uh, um, yeah, so I think, I think it's incredibly difficult. My name is Gary Hinchy. I'm an artist here at, uh, at Front Street in Dayton, Ohio. I've been, uh, I'm a designer by education and I've, so all, all of my work is really designed and, and, and completely figured out before it ever gets on a canvas. To some extent, actually painting it is, is, is uh, uh, anticlimactic. It's almost the, it's the, the end of the process and it's, a, it's really a, a, a matter of, of just producing what I've already defined uh, in, in very in extreme detail. As you can see behind me, these are very, very tight. Again, trained as, as a designer, but I've painted all of my life. Uh, uh, very young, I was, uh, I had a mentor when I was 10 to 15, 16 years old. And I was really trained almost uh, with in a, in a real classical sense. I, I had a very a long uh, graphic design career. I had my own my own uh, studio in in Los Angeles for 25 years as a as a young as a young man. Uh, 
my family encouraged me to not do the art, but to to do something where you can make a living. I think was absolutely the wrong advice, because I think if I if I had just concentrated on the on the on the art, I would have done perfectly well, perfectly fine uh, along that path, and and perhaps be much further along in in my development than I am. Um, Frankly, so my advice is to follow the passion. And and uh, uh, if you're if you're interested in uh, if a young person is interested in making a lot of money, this is probably not the not the field you want to go into. What would you say is the greatest obstacle you've had to overcome to become successful? I think the hardest thing for me has been how to market my own work. Uh, I'm not very good at it. I just, I just can't do it for myself. Like I say, I'm from Chicago. We're a nice city and people are kind, but but Dayton is welcoming and kind. Oh, yeah. I made so many lifelong, wonderful, true friends. Mm -hmm. um, and just the ability for people to support each other the way they do. That's the one thing we notice here at Front Street because we not only have artists, we have startup incubator businesses, we have inventors. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really kind of one, one of the things that drew me when I first came down here about Front Street is that we have like the woodworkers, we have a guy who rebuilds hydraulic cylinders, we have uh, co hoist that builds the uh, boat list. Uh, and all those people are at the top of their games. So we don't really have a lot of people who are just kind of just squeaking by, just kind of doing okay. They all want to be the best and all trying to be the best. My name is Leanne Wagner, and my company is Fairy Godmother Creations. We are a custom sewing service. And what we do is we specialize in taking people's heirloom garments and retasking them for the next generation. A lot of families have a garment that reminds them of a loved one, or a garment that is part of a, a special time in their family history, a wedding dress, uh, a special fur coat. And those things sometimes aren't usable by the next generation. And so what I do is I turn them into something that the next generation can use. I'll take the fur coat and I'll turn it into teddy bears for the kids or the grandkids. I'll take the wedding dress, I'll turn it into christening outfits for the grandkids, or I'll turn it into a quilt. So that's what we do. I make things for people out of their materials and I send them back to them. How long does it take you to make one? Just one teddy bear? Um, well, a bear like this, a fur bear, by the time we've deconstructed the coat, we've got about five hours in it. Wow. How much money does it take? Or what's your investment? What's the cost? The investment is primarily labor. You know, the, the customers provide almost all the materials. I provide the stuffing, the eyes and nose, the joints. So all together, around five to eight dollars, depending on the size of the bear in materials. Everything else is is labor. And it's time intensive. And if you know when you're in business as opposed to hobby, it, there are all kinds of expenses that accumulate. You know, I I have a payroll, I have employees, I have payroll taxes, I have insurance, I have internet and phone that are separate from personal. You know, um, I have utilities. So for me, I have to have about $7,000 a month come in this door in order to just pay my overhead bills and my employees and a little bit for me. This is a, a business that deals with life and death, with celebration and grief. And in a lot of ways, I get to experience those emotions with many of my customers. I've had customers send in their wedding dress because they were terminally ill and they knew that they were at the end of their life and they wanted to give something to family members before they went. And I, in one case, the woman that I made the things for passed away three days after she received the items I made. I have had um, garments come from people who died in 9-11, um, that I made things for their grandchildren who never got to meet them. So we, we do a lot of, uh, we interact with families at a time that has meaning in their lives. 
That's kind of what, you know, what I get out of this. <laughs> this certainly isn't a really good income. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, it gives me a chance to kind of be a little bit a part of everybody's family. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. In the days before the internet, competition for an artist came from other artists in their neighborhood, their city, or their state. Artists in the digital age are now competing with millions of other artists from across their country and around the globe. It's like sitting at the bottom of an ocean of creatives, hoping someone notices your artwork. In 2019, there were 300 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. More than 4 million hours of content uploaded every day. Its users watch 5.97 billion hours of videos each day. Users watch 4.3 million videos every minute. 1.2 million new data producing social media users were created each day. 682 million tweets per day. 67 million Instagram posts uploaded. There were over 2 billion monthly active Facebook users. 4.3 billion Facebook messages posted daily and 5.7 billion Facebook likes every day. The optimist would say, wow, with a huge audience like that, I'm bound to sell a ton of work. But it takes a savvy marketing and advertising mind to get the attention of a shopper on the internet today. Microsoft did a study and discovered that the attention span of the average human is no more than eight seconds. Um, I saw a post yesterday that said, in like 15 minutes, 80 years of video are uploaded to YouTube. Uh, like a gargantuan mm. amount. How mm. do you think the digital age has changed art and artistry? I, I think that it really, um, like you say, a lot of information gets out there, but it's hard to digest it all. So I think you have to be really diligent about what you put out there and what's going to get so strike somebody's cord because you got a split second to get their attention. Yeah. So you, yeah. That, that's where really being sharp on the business end of things yeah. really is important. But I think, too, once the vaccines are in place and life has a semblance of normalcy, people enjoyed coming out and walking and seeing the studios. You can walk into someone's studio and see them create. You see how they do it. Mike Elsa brings people in and throws paint around and sand and there are kids and you're walking through paint and you're just, but you're just alive. My name is Mike Elso. I paint on recycled steel. I uh, sold health insurance, group insurance to schools and corporations. Sold my business and uh, fortunate to be a full-time artist for 20 years, 21 years. So uh, any money I make from the sale of art goes directly to the racetrack. So you got Thistle Down up there and Keeneland and Belmont and so this just goes directly to the racetrack. It's a it's acrylic uh, water-based paint. Um, I don't have any rules. I paint brush before the brain and uh, I think about it later. There's no mistakes. Uh, so uh, I'm using uh, a variety of textures all kind of silicate sands, grit from sandpaper grit from Germany, turmeric powder, uh, crushed glass, uh, Z-Bart, which is the undercoating of your car or tar. I love mixing oil and water. So I'm looking around, I'm not sure what you're filming, but uh, when, I, when I put the final coat on, it's oil-based. And I will add water and, and the acrylic paint in there, which is water-based, and that makes a neat bead. Okay. So, what are you eating, Brooklyn? Applesauce. Is that okay? That's fine. Yeah, they, it's okay with them, so... Uh, <laughs> now, will she be able to see this someday? Someday, yeah, probably by sometime next year. Next year, Brooklyn. Hold on, stay in my pocket. Bye. Who do you got in your pocket? Uh, my grandkids. The grandkids are your pocket. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know which way it hangs, so if you're looking around at this work, it's just hanging that way, but it could hang four directions. I don't know uh, which side I'm going to paint on. So, uh, in my world, we can resize it. So, uh, so if you absolutely loved this piece and it was six inches too big, we just cut it. 
And that's kind of my philosophy. We're trying to bring beauty from from rust and decay, and, and it all so fits the Dayton, the, oh, the Ohio area, the Rust Belt area. So. How much is the cost of the buy by the town? Well, the, it's a uh, steel is a commodity, so the Chinese have a big influence, and so. Uh, Typically, it's about 42 cents a pound. I don't pay much attention to that. Uh, I'm at the stage of my life where I'm not out buying boats. I'm buying all the steel I can get and trying to learn how to paint. So uh, I, I paint with brushes. Um, I probably should grab one. And, and uh, uh, on the canister, it says for ages three and up. So uh, that gives you an idea of my uh, of my sense. What do you think it's like to live the life of an artist? There again, we it kind of runs a gamut from uh, straight lace to the ones who are, you know, out there willing to try anything. Um, uh, as far as artwork goes, uh, they're all very, uh, very creative. I think that uh, you have to have an open mind, obviously, if you want to be an artist and want to be be successful at it, and, and really set yourself apart and find your own voice. You know, when, when I say find your own voice, find your style of, of artwork that that people like and engage with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I've noticed too that looks are somewhat deceiving yeah. because there are guys here that look like they've got. You know, I was in the business world and not the art world. I was in a law firm. I mean, these these some of these guys they've got long hair and crazy clothes and you know I would look at them as oh what are they doing and you know they're out there and they're very serious about their craft they're extremely talented and they're focused I've done a various things I tend to bob and weave a lot but I kind of come back to some of my core um, focuses I guess I would say mostly spending well spending a lot of time in Dayton Ohio you know you grow up in the, the Rust Belt and always been drawn to, I've lived in a lot of places in Dayton, um, suburbs, but as an adult now I'm downtown. Um, but before that, um, during and after college, um, going around to actually Front Street warehouses and then the train tracks behind and the dumpsters, uh, looking for sculptural found object material to do art with. We were very drawn to, I think we was kind of growing up with seeing all the rust and mechanical bits. And <laughs> so I like repurposing things. So I've come back to that after about 20 years. Moving back just three years ago, I've kind of found my love of rust again. Um, I could do um, these things on cow hides. I know it sounds a little creepy, but uh, <laughs> I like to repurpose materials. I guess to talk about rusty stuff. Um, these are from um, of um, Wendy's husband place of work. They still make, he makes um, firefighter protective wear. And remarkably, they still make firefighter helmets out of the core based on these hides. I think they probably form them and maybe cover them in Kevlar and other fireproof things. But they're pretty much like white canvases. And uh, he was asked to throw them all away when they moved offices and he kept them because he just knew somebody was going to be able to use them. When I moved back to town, he's like, Rachel, what do you think? So they've been awesome. So then when I got a hold of these, I was finally able to like bust loose. So this, these kind of pieces are a whole new new for me using things I've never used before, like oil pastel. I moved some, obviously my collage work onto these cow hides. Um, spray paint, which I never worked in. And there's, can't tell them, but there's tons and tons of old school uh, color pencil um, detailing in these and the birds. And uh, I, I, it's been a great ride. How hard do you think it is to be an artist from what you've observed? you think it's a hard, hard living to try to make a living as an artist? If, it, if it's in your heart, it's not hard. It's, it's, you know, I think that you really have to want it to do it. And you got to put the time and effort into it. The, the biggest thing I see when artists don't quite make it, they don't understand the business side of things. I think if you just, to, if I, if I make this artwork, they're going to come. Um, it, there's a lot more to it. And you have to be somewhat sophisticated and to recognize what you need to be doing to get your artwork out there and to be out there, right? To put yourself out there. Don't You can't be shy. Oh, yeah. You can't be a wallflower. Uh, so I think it depends about what you want to get out of it. Some artists want to just have a place so they can go 
turn the key in the door and, and create. And if they ever sell, fine. If they don't sell, um, so I have a good friend of ours, um, Gary Bieber. He's that way. He, he does great work and he shows all around the world. And um, he's not necessarily worried about selling because he doesn't have to sell. I'm Sandra Pichano Brand, and our business is called Mythic Silver. And I'm David Brand, also Mythic Silver. Uh, and we're metalsmiths, jewelers, and um, sculptors as well. So how did you guys get started? What, uh, what inspired this business? Well, we each had our own path to jewelry, I think. Uh, uh, she was probably earlier than I was, but I, I, I worked as an engineer for some 35 years. And, and at the, towards the end, I, uh, I took a class at Riverbend Art Center in, in uh, what I thought was uh, making large sculptures, but it turned out to be uh, what they called uh, metal fabrication was uh, jewelry making. And so... Uh, I actually, I kind of liked it, and so I took a couple classes uh, in jewelry making where you saw out things and solder things together. And then I took a class in casting, and uh, I, I guess I really turned on to that, uh, lost wax casting. And I took that for a little bit, and uh, the guy that was teaching it says, gosh, you're ready, why don't you teach the class? And so... <laughs> I taught at Riverbend for some time, and then uh, my work was good enough that uh, I entered art shows and, and uh, was successful in that regard. And so we've just been carrying on from there. I have other interests and hobbies. Well, first of all, I'm a gardener. So gardening um, inspires my work. And... And so basically I, I just make jewelry and there's so much, so many different techniques to learn and to be, you know, to get skilled at that it, it takes a lifetime to know, to learn maybe, I don't know, a tenth of, of the techniques. So I liked it uh, going into it as an art form because there was so much challenge and uh, opportunity to have lifelong learning. So everything we see or most of what we see is built basically from scratch. You're not just going to a metal shop and buying a bunch of metal and bending it and putting it on a chain. You're actually no. building this from it's, scratch. It's all, it's all yeah. an original vision. Yeah. And I think uh, you asked about success. I think that's part of the idea that we were both uh, creative thinkers and, uh, and designers. And so we have unique designs. Uh, we spend time going out to uh, uh, gem and mineral shows, finding special stones that to go with our pieces that are, are unique. And uh, so that's that's part of the the way you get success is uh, uh, look, at, look at what is available in the world that you can bend to your needs. So there's a little piece of you in everything you make. Everything. Everything we do is handmade. It's our original vision. So this, this dimensional shape here is created with the hydraulic press. Uh, I'll use this one right here. And I've got the metal all set up here. And I have to lay it on a steel plate. Uh, get it positioned pretty good. I'll push the... And put this up into the press. Make sure it's all centered to three. And now it's the magic has happened. Piston down a little bit. And here is that form that we created. And you take those opposite pieces and solder them together and saw it out along the edge uh, to create this shape. Song. You heard it on the radio.
radio each and every night We made love listening to that too Music was my first love. When I was nine, I would sit in my bedroom and sing along to Beatle records, hoping that Debbie Rolaine, the beautiful blonde 12-year-old girl in the apartment above ours, would hear me singing and fall madly in love. Unfortunately, our deep love for each other never materialized in the real world. I'm not sure whatever became of Debbie, but at the age of 14, after pestering my mom for several years, she bought me my first guitar. Mom was the initial source of my inspiration to become an artist. She was a naturally gifted artist who could create in any medium. She walked away from her dream to become an artist when she married my father in 1949. Near the end of her life, I asked her why she never pursued her dream of becoming an artist, and she replied, referring to my father, of course, she was a sucker for the strong, silent type. She also said, sometimes your dreams change. Every now and then, my mom would pick up a pencil and sketch a few pictures on a sketchbook or on a scrap piece of paper. I remember once when I was seven and homesick with the flu, she did a quick sketch of me laying on the couch, commenting how she could always tell how sick I was by the sad look I'd get in my beautiful green eyes. Anytime mom drew anything, I would just sit in awe as the sketch came to life on the paper. It was because of my mom that I dreamed of becoming an artist. So, in the fall of 1984, I attended Ohio University to study graphic design. At the end of my sophomore year, my academic advisor explained that I had two career options with my degree choice, work as an art teacher or work at Kinko's. Not thrilled with either choice, I decided to change my degree to communications and public speaking. I was convinced that this choice would help me secure a lucrative career in the corporate world. In 1988, I graduated with a degree in communications. After college, I embarked on a career in the corporate world. But for me, sitting in a cubicle was a long, slow, torturous death. I'd sit at my desk regretting the day I changed my major and stare out the window dreaming of going back to school to complete my fine arts degree. Then in 2006, I did the unthinkable. One more time. At the age of 41, after lengthy discussions with my wife, I quit my day job and went back to school to study web design and become the artist I had always dreamed of becoming. I recorded my first CD in 1998, 1999 of 12 original songs. The CD's called Child's Play. I've never become famous. I've never become wealthy from it. But I, I do, in the summer times, prior to COVID-19, I was playing out every week. I had private gigs at, at private residences, at golf courses, coffee, coffee houses, uh, restaurants. I played out all the time. This summer, it's been completely dead. This summer, I've gotten absolutely nothing because of the, co the COVID-19. So, but I've written and recorded about 150 songs. I've written about 150 songs, I've recorded probably about 60 of them over the years. I didn't really get a job in the arts until I started playing guitar again in, the, in, in my early, or late to mid-20s after my mother passed away. In 1992, I started playing guitar again. I started writing songs. And people started hiring me to play in coffee shops and small parties and bars. So that was my first real artistic gig. was in my mid-20s. But other than that, everything I did prior to that was in the corporate world. How much time do you think you spend working on you know, your, your music and your photography and... Your, your art endeavors? Well, you know, I spend hours and hours on my projects. Um, it just depends. It depends if it's a, uh, a location shoot where I have to go and take equipment with me um, or if it's a music gig. But I, I can spend as much as 40 to 50 hours a week, just like somebody working in a cubicle would spend. Working on editing, taking pictures, buying equipment, researching equipment, researching software researching clients, doing um, location researches. Um, what's not location, what's it called? What do you call it, Eric? Location scout. That's it, Lo <laughs> location scouting. Um, there's a lot of drive time. and So I'll spend sometimes anywhere from 40 to 50 hours a week 
or more depending on the project and the scope of the project. We've talked about like the time that it costs you. How much money do you think it costs? That varies. I mean, just, just this week, um, I spent probably a couple thousand dollars on um, camera equipment and lenses and lights and attorney's fees too. <laughs> and uh, then the one year I spent probably $10,000 in marketing and advertising just to get my name out there. I mean, I can't even begin to talk about the money I've dumped into business cards that are useless. I mean, I've given out thousands and thousands of business cards in, in multiple states and it said little or no um, response from the business cards. I just, I've stopped printing business cards altogether. I find everybody finds you on the internet now. So it can vary, it just depends on the year and budgeting and things like that, but it gets, it gets really expensive. It's very expensive. I, you sound like you have a pretty good handle on how hard it is, but Logan, let's hypothetically, if your mom kicked you out the door right now, said, I this hit the road. Could you live off of what you made doing what you do here, like you pay all the bills? And Not at this stage, no, I'd have to, I would have to get up a full-time job in the, in the economy of some sort. I'm, I'm really hoping to, to get this to a point where it pays its way. And there are people who do it and I'm doing my homework as, as far as marketing goes. And then the gigs, the gigs are coming in. If I could, if I could get the, some of the work I get, if I could get it steadily, I could live, I could be okay. But it's just hard. It is hard. And, and, and what, what do you do between gigs and what do you do for cash flow yeah. when, uh, when they don't come in? Yeah, if I, if, I could, if I could have, if all year could be like the last quarter of, of 2019, I'd be fine. I'm going to make the most wonderful, wildest, wickiest things you've ever seen. I'm going to make big statues and little statues, tall statues and short statues. I'm going to make statues of nobodies and statues of famous people, statues of actors and, and poets and people who sell things on television and a statue of a mayor and some opera singers and their intimate friends. And everybody will say, Walter, let me shake your hand. It's been a real pleasure to have known you. You can't go into the arts with the expectation that you're going to be a star. That, 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 that's something else. And I, I, say it to, I say it to dancers, I say it to even visual artists, I say it to any artist. If you're in it for that reason, to get a love and attention, you need to get a really good therapist and work all that shit out. Because <laughs> that is... Yeah, yeah. You, well, that, that, that makes you vulnerable yeah. to being used. Oh, yeah. Because you're seeking validation. I'm like, what, what? Just do it. I'm like, pfft. Casting couch. You know, well, yeah, you, you, we joke. You end up in a casting couch. Yeah. You end up uh, as a visual artist getting, you're willing to take any deal that a gallery owner gives you and signing on a dotted line and not knowing that like, you've just signed away the light rights to all your work and you getting pins on a dollar, you know, all these things that you have to take and see because of your desperation for it is a recording contract. It's like a recording contract where they own the masters and you don't own the masters of the music. So that means that you have, to, you, you're, you're stuck. You know, you're constantly perpetually paying that pers other person who's used you because you pursued the fame. But you just, I just want to be a star. If you want it, you have to put your heart and soul in it. And if you think you have a plan B, I think that there's always this sort of, there's part of you that holds back. And I, I don't know, I think you can. Yeah. Um, I think you have to totally immerse yourself. Um, and I do believe that if you feel, if you feel led to be an artist, I think things, they, they, they will, there's things that come into play or there are, there are elements that you can't even conceive of that will happen. Um, and so you just have to trust uh, and have faith. This is where you're supposed to be and this is what you're supposed to be doing. If you were to go back in time, what, what would you give young Logan? What advice would you give young Logan? I would say work a lot harder, a lot sooner. I'd, I'd say maybe move to an area where there's more of an arts community as much as I love my little town. 
I would say spread your wings. And it goes quick. It goes very quickly. What, what advice should you give uh, an upcoming artist or art student to help them succeed? I would say the same thing. And I would also say talk to as many people as possible in this line of work. With social media, it's never been easier to reach out to a big community of people. Oh, networking. Yes, absolutely. Networking has never been easier. There is no substitute for putting miles on the brush. I belong to the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, and they, they have a favorite saying is B-I-C, which is butt in chair. You can talk about it, you can think about it, but you, your butt needs to be in the chair, brush needs to be in your hand, and you need to, you need to be working. And you said you'd done maybe three hours of work a day. So do you think you put, how many hours a week do you think you put in on your craft overall? Uh, not enough. So if, if the world were ruled by artists, do you, do you think this would be a better world or a worse world? I think it'd be better. Um, because coming from a different side of your brain and people I think would feel a lot more comfortable um, making decisions for the whole rather than just for themselves. Hmm. I think there would be a better understanding of how things work and a more and a better appreciation of who people are. I think it would certainly be more creative. I think maybe we'd have different perspectives on maybe how we look at different things. Um, so yeah, I think it would certainly maybe help things a little bit more. The comments of like when they, someone sees a Jackson Pollock, oh, well, my grandchild could do that. What does that mean? My Jack grandchild can do that. Like, I, so you're saying it's less than because if your grandchild did this, I, what is it, what, I, it's like it, it's childlike. Uh, like any, like a child could do it. Well, there are child geniuses. So what, what the person trying to say is this? This is not done by by someone I can that I respect. When we say, "Oh, you know, I can just slap some paint around," or anyone can do it, oh, I, and that 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 belittles what it is in the process. It believes it belittles the rigor that you have to think things through, how you have to conceive, you have to immerse yourself into understanding what it is that you're trying to relay. That you have to understand materials and supplies. You have to be willing, like a scientist, to do trial and error and experiments. <laughs> no one goes and Jackson Pollock didn't start making the drip paintings. He started off in a very figurative approach from Thomas Hart Benton. But if you don't know history and you don't know the context of how Jackson Pollock became Jackson Pollock, you see the end result. You think it's easy. Usually the things that are put within museums are the are the best work or representative works of an artist so there is an ease to them because that person has immersed themselves in that process of making work there it should look brilliant because they're they're in the zone so for the average person oh i could do that yeah they don't know that there's a foundation for working from color composition History, context, design, um, tools, materials. You, um, who, as much as I do not like math, you still have to figure out equations for like measurements. I mean, you know, you've got to figure out, you know, chemicals sometimes have different reactions. You have to know what chemicals are. You have to know reading is fundamental. I mean, there's so many things that are that they go into being the artist that are discounted because of the end result. Now, um, that being said, we as artists have to then ask for, not just ask for, demand the respect from the public by not doing things are, that, are, that invite the disrespect. That means, no, it's like, get, like oh, grab that art form. Like, I'm in it to win it, or like, or I'm in it to be the artist because your passion about it should show. You don't have, you know, all the things that 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 could 
not hold people at a distance, but invite them in, but then also to recognize that they have never really sat down with artists to understand how artists make art. I think without artists, there's a lot of things that the general public takes for granted. There'd be no music, there'd be no movies, there'd be no video games. There'd be no TV shows. There'd be no cereal boxes. I mean, you'd have a black and white society of being plain, dull, and lifeless. And a lot of people just take it for granted. And I think it's, it's time people kind of took it more seriously. I think the general public has this idea that us artists are just running through tall fields of grass, frolicking about chasing after butterflies or something. And it's not true. And I had that preconceived notion in college the first time around. I thought I was going to get out of school and I was going to have a big studio in, you know, in the flats in Cleveland in a warehouse with tall windows. And I'd be having easels all over the place of paintings. And I thought I was going to have wild parties with wild women wearing, you know, black berets and to be kinky sex and stuff. But that that's not what's needed. It's not the truth. I mean, there are some people who have kinky wild parties, but most of those people aren't very good artists. They're, they're all about their image, their purple hair and their piercings and their tattoos. They're not focused on the craft. <clears throat> I'm not putting on people with purple hair and tattoos, but uh, there's some preconceived notions from, from the artist's perspective and the general public's perspective that's really out of whack. And we're not just having fun. It, this is fun. I mean, you know, what better world could it be in where you sit in front of a camera and talk or make a video or paint a painting, but there's a lot more to it than what the public sees. Do that again with the eyebrows, it was fun. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that. I mean, Groucho Marx, like that Groucho. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Logan had the question. What is the question? The question is, is it worth it? And I say... Drinking beer? Yes. No, the art, work, the art business. And I say, must be, I keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Must be. Yeah. Do you feel a sense of self-accomplishment after all this time? Not always, but I don't know what else I would do. Yeah. If I didn't have the creative outlet, I would probably lose my mind. Yeah. Because I know. Uh, I'm not going to give up on it until I'm too old to hold a brush. The highway of life cuts sharply through the shady ghettos and the ivy-covered tombs, and laughter rings from every time capsule in the star-spangled firmament. And in the deep freeze, it is the children's hour. Alley cats and garbage cans and steaming pavements, and you and I and the nude descending the staircase, and all such things with so we know that Walter Paisley is born. Ring rubber bells, beat cotton gongs, strikes silken symbols, play leathern flutes, the cats and cans, and you and I, and all such things with souls, we shall hear, Walter Paisley is born, and the souls become flesh, Walter Paisley is born. Marvelous, darling, marvelous. Man, like that was the greatest gas I ever heard. Crazy, what did he say? <laughs> Didn't you hear him? No, man, I'm too far out. During the filming of this movie, I never discovered artists having wild parties while wearing black berets and smoking brown cigarettes. I came to the conclusion that that's all Hollywood. I did, however, meet a variety of wonderful people from all walks of life, each with different levels of talent all of them beginning their artistic journey at different points in their lives. The most important things I discovered while making this movie, it's never too late to create art. There are multiple paths you can follow to becoming a creative. Success doesn't mean fame and fortune. 
Honestly, if you feel deep down inside that you're put on this earth to create, be true to yourself and make the time in your life to be who you were meant to be. Toss all the stereotypical Hollywood garbage that you've seen in movies about artists out the window. The life of an artist is not easy. You don't have to and shouldn't quit your day job. You'll be misunderstood and underappreciated. You'll be envied. You may or may not make money at your craft, but you'll find success beyond your wildest dreams, knowing you were true to yourself. Lost all my money. Was filled with rain in the pouring rain. I was headed nowhere at all. Till your love broke my fall. 